our attendees are certainly in the right place. <laughs> this is tea space, and the lecture of Tom Hain is about to begin. We will uh, take a couple of moments uh, for introductions. And we will start in a minute or two. Welcome, welcome. All right. People are excited, we are excited as well. And um, I will take a moment to start, um, not one moment, maybe a, a few moments, five minutes or so. Um, so welcome to T-Space, so welcome to the architecture lecture series. Thank you for joining us today for the lecture of Tom Main, titled Willful Randomness, Ideas, Patterns, and Forms of Intentions. We will start with this brief introduction. This is the seventh in a series of eight public lectures organized by T-Space within the framework of the Architecture Residency Program. I'm Irini Tsakhreli. I practice an architect and an educator in New York. I'm currently instructing and directing the Architecture Residency Program for T-Space. For those of you who are new, um, T-Space is a nonprofit organization. It's an initiative of the Stephen Myron Hall Foundation, which focuses on arts, education, design, and ecology. This place introduced the architecture residency program five years ago. It takes place once a year, every July, and it is a 25 day intensive, urging the residents to design and think critically. This year's theme and design is a continuation of last year's transformation of consciousness. And we've actually entered the final stretch of the program with one more week to go uh, until completion. I'm especially grateful for uh, our scholarship program, which is growing every year. Our residents um, this year have received either a partial or a full scholarships, thanks to the very generous support by Steve Pullimont, Silman Engineers, the Al Health Foundation, and the Art of Building in Rhinebeck, among others. We do welcome your support as well to make more scholarships possible in the future and to help T-Space carry out its mission in education. If you are enjoying the program, you may like to consider making a contribution now. Just click on the link in the chat and we'll be very, very grateful for your support. In addition to the residency program, T-Space organizes the, the, what we call the synthesis of the arts events at the intersection of art, architecture, music, and poetry. Our first synthesis event, Raptures and Reconciliations, is now on show at T-Space Gallery in Rhinebeck. You can schedule an in-person visit by clicking on the link that you can see in the chat. And our second synthesis event for 2021 is coming up by the end of August. It is called Suspended Collapse. It fe features Lead Pencil Studio, poetry by Lisa Robertson, and music by Lester St. Louis. Again, you can find the links to RSVP for these upcoming events in the chat. Most of our program this summer is, taken, is, is virtual, same as last year. Yet T-Space Gallery did open its doors for in-person visits in Rhinebeck just last weekend, and it will be open every Sunday until the end of September. That's by appointment only. I do encourage you to join our mailing list uh, to receive announcements about all our events uh, firsthand. And you may also like to consider subscribing to our YouTube channel where you can access all the recordings of our lecture series and events, a truly valuable resource. With us today is Max Welfang. He is also an architect, the residency host. Hi, Max. He has been a great help organizing the residency program. Thank you, Max. Well, and I will pass this on to you to welcome our residents who are here on the panel, who we will introduce uh, the, um, our main guests for today. So, Max. Excellent. OK, so um, thanks, everyone, for attending. And I'd like to welcome our residents, Reginald Mace, Alexander Kern, Brian Hartman, Megan Zarchik, Jack Wathew, and Yolande Wen, um, all of whom are young professionals and students in the field of art and architecture with backgrounds in art, 
music and philosophy. They're a fantastic cohort this, this summer to have. Um, Tom's lecture today will be approximately 35 to 40 minutes with uh, a 15 minute Q&A at the end of it uh, titled Willful Randomness, Ideas, Patterns and Forms of Intentions. Um, two of our residents today, Megan and Brian, will moderate today's event. Um, they're both pursuing their bachelor's degree in architecture at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Brian, joining us from LA, will lead our public Q&A session at the, at the last 15 minutes. And Megan, who is joining from Pennsylvania, will now introduce our guest speaker, Tom Main. Well, she shortly will when he pops up. <laughs> Thank you, Maxwell. No I'll try to be succinct. Um, it is a real, real pleasure today and privilege to have the opportunity to introduce an architect who I've admired for the greater part of my, albeit short, existence within the discipline of architecture. Tom Main is the world-renowned Pritzker Prize winning founder of the practice Morphosis. Deeply rooted in rigorous research and innovation, his firm challenges traditional forms and materials while operating globally across a wide spe spectrum of projects, typologies, and scales often distinguishing itself for innovative and sustainable designs for cultural, civic, and academic institutions. Throughout his career, Maine has remained active in the academic world. In 1972, he helped to establish the Southern California Institute of Architecture, otherwise known as SciArc. Since then, he has held teaching positions at many esteemed institutions around the world. Uh, Maine was a tenured professor at the University of California, Los Angeles Architecture and Urban Design from 1993 to 2019. And there's always been a symbiotic relationship between Maine's teaching and practice, evidenced in his concurrent positions as executive director of the NOW Institute. Morphosis is research arm that collaborates with academic institutions to create design-based solutions for the pressing issues of the day, from mobility, urban revitalization, and sustainability, to public policy, planning, and community outreach. Maine's distinguished honors include the Pritzker Prize in 2005 and the American Institute of Architects Gold Medal in 2013. He served on the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities under President, President Obama. And um, with Morphosis, Maine has been the recipient of 29 Progressive Architecture Awards, more than 120 AIA awards, and numerous other design recognitions. <laughs> I could elaborate endlessly on the accomplishments of our lecturer today, but I would just like to end with a personal note that I feel I have felt incredibly grateful to be a part of Stephen Hole's T Space residency. And today I feel exceptionally privileged to have the opportunity to introduce an architect whose work I have studied and restudied throughout my academic career. So please join me in welcoming Tom Main. Thanks, Megan. Am I am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Megan, Welcome. thank you very much. That's very, very generous. Where am I down here? Am I here? PowerPoint. Ah, here it is. This is, let me explain first. Um, this is for all the right here, right? Whoop. PowerPoint. And share. Okay. Okay, I've got five parts here. And let me first explain to everybody here. I um, had the opportunity to actually be here. I'm at T-Space physically, and I worked out some kind of shifts in my schedule because I thought I was going to actually see you. It had never occurred to me because it's um, a lot of the academic world around is opening up. And uh, I just had a conversation with the head of SciArc and we're opening up physically and I've got my class right now in the summer. <clears throat> and so I just assumed somehow that you were gonna be here. And so what I did, which is gonna be a little strange for you guys, but we'll figure it out here. Number one, I put together some, um, a discussion that was very specifically oriented towards um, my friend and longtime uh, associate, Stephen Hall and um, that we've been chatting for decades. <clears throat> and, and, and I thought it was gonna be six of you and I tried to make it quite specific and quite personal and we'll just see how it kind of works out. And I'm also gonna be very clear that um, it's coming from a practicing architecture, an architect that's trying to be useful to you as people that are moving into this profession and I take um, my role as a teacher somewhat seriously and that I'm hopefully being somehow helpful to you in your um, trajectory of become, becoming an architect. And I'm definitely interested in the architecture as a built act 
and is a social art form, all right? Um, I'm gonna zip through, um, I'm gonna get to a set of interests I have at this very particular time, but to get there, I need to talk about a few things just to get you um, uh, into uh, the perspective of where I'm coming from. And it'll definitely set up a conversation with Stephen, who's sitting right next to me. I'm in his studio. I'm looking over and his you, shoulder. There. <laughs> and, um, okay. and I just, why the question? Why? That was yesterday, last night, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm showing you my new tat and it's basically, that it's, it's Mandarin for a question, but an open-ended question that to be curious, not, not necessarily looking for an answer. Okay, I'm gonna go through these kind of five areas <clears throat> and I'm gonna give you kind of images that I was looking at when I was you or just a little older than you that had a profound effect to me as I look in the rear view mirror and go back. And uh, let me see, I gotta get, you guys are on top of my images here. I gotta move you. Oh yeah, I can't move you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Chaco Canyon on the left, uh, a, a microcell of an onion skin. This, um, the, the photograph of the, the microcell has preoccupied me for 40 years. And then I was, I was just innately interested in the complexity of the organizational structure of what you were looking at and the complexity and the diversity of that structure. And, and, and it immediately somehow connected to a very different notion of urban, urban settlement of Chaco Canyon. And it's, um, I guess, instinctively challenging my academic work, which is gonna move more towards Palladio which never made sense to me just intuitively. And then it very quickly hooked up to the present with certain acts of land art um, having to do with it, what was taking place in the, the late 60s and 70s, which was had a pr profound effect to me, I think much more than architecture in a way. I was looking at these, these acts as something that were gonna propel me. And it was again, completely connected to um, various historical acts, whether it's Nazca or whether it's um, Lebius Wood's piece in, in, in Paris, that is um, the fall, yeah. That uh, that monumentalizing, uh, making physical one of his drawings, which was so much about infrastructure and connected to these things. And then the early work was filled with this notion of work that came from multiple sources. It was not interested in objects. It was interested in the relationship of objects, the relationships of, of parts and pieces that made up the. Um, the, the, the essence of the work, and it all had to do with relationships, with the connection of things vis-a-vis -vis the thing. And this propelled us for a couple of decades. <clears throat> and as it integrated with the interest in earth, there was an immediate connection between organizational ideas, which had to do with a certain level of complexity, which had to do with multiple forces that make up our work, right? And the ultimate complexity of those forces, operating ecologically, um, urbanistically, technologically, et cetera, and um, the relationship of ground. And then I'm, I put this in just to remind you is I'm gonna to move to something much more abstract at this point. And I'm gonna direct a, a series of uh, questions to, to, to my friend, Stephen. Um, but before that, I just wanna remind you that I basically, um, I'm gonna show you conceptual work, but it's coming from um, a person that's engaged in, in, in the, the running of a studio and that performs like an architect, a project that we're just finishing in Korea, research center, a, a tower in Shenzhen, very much about the experience of movement and, and the connection of the urban environment, a project in, in Nanjing, convention center. It's funny, I'm getting much less interested in talking about buildings that there's, um, I'm not sure what I can actually, um, how useful I can be in terms of moving information from, from me to you. In these cases, they represent enormous complexities. And um, it's just, um, there'd be no way I could really explain this really to you. It, 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 we had a couple of days maybe. It operates on so many different levels. And I mean levels in terms of kind of where the design comes from. If you're interested in the locating interest of design, and again, what I'm very particularly, and I was interested in talking to the six of you that I thought I was going to see here, was um, it, it seems like the discussion today has to do with the location of your work. What are the premises 
that you're utilizing to produce your work that are issues that are relevant to the 21st century that have to do with your definition of architecture as it participates with contemporary society, right? And um, if I'm useful to you, it's somehow being able to help clarify those issues in terms of your projects, right? And the derivation of that project, which I'm gonna to get to. And then this um, 250 meter space, that's the collective space. And then they're gonna be see things as I talk to you into the, or the organizational stuff. Some of this will make sense to you as we discuss kind of the roots of this coming from my interest in um, the abstraction of architecture. <clears throat> And if there's going to be a, a meta narrative, of what we're going to talk about in the, in the, in the next few minutes, it'll, it'll have to do with that architecture starts with an abstraction. And it'd be something that absolutely divides architects to some level, right? If they're interested in that. Okay. Um, I got interested in kind of exploring um, organizational ideas about five years ago and started producing a series of pieces um, constructs and their resulting drawings that were interested in um, organizational ideas, which, which pr propel diversity and uh, differentiation. And that I saw is parallel to the needs of the derivation of my architecture, which has become um, more and more complex in its um, programmatic circumstance and its siting and its scale. And I'm interested in organizational strategies, which are gonna go way back to that image I showed you, the nanocell, that have to do with the complexity of the forces that we deal with today as architects, having to do with um, a work that concretizes the nature of the, uh, the inputs of our work. And um, I'm interested in parallel to that, and something that's been, a, something that's been kind of lingering in all of my work in chance behavior. And of course, chance is, um, you could say, a, um, would be one of the projects of the 20th century, starting with ARP and Duchamp. And we could add it, that itself would be a couple hour kind of conversation. And um, the relationship of chance as it is with conscious um, invention, conscious creativity, right? And it's something that's always been kind of floating around in, in, in the work that I've been interested in having to do with these relationships of things and the, um, the contamination, the combinatory behavior that takes place as things meet and speak to each other or interact, right? And it literally goes way back from the very beginning, starting with maybe for me, the Venice Three House. <clears throat> and now I'm looking at it um, in a very different way and it, it's post computer. And I'm still working with the, the relationship between um, a classical way of working the way I was trained and the, um, the, the, the post digital age. And I now have uh, abilities to bring to bear uh, at a much more complicated set of organizational ideas having to do with the, um, the operations that are digital. And then what I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you here is a series of uh, an investigation that deals with the relationship of willfulness and chance. And um, the notion of, uh, I guess an escape from figuration, an escape from a priori thinking, um, an escape from anything that's fixed as a beginning point that, 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 that fosters openness and that asks questions and that leads us somewhere in something that clearly is invested in operational strategy versus the thing. And I think one of the, one of the territories that I've been interested in for, um, for, for, for a couple of decades is I've been very trusting of an operational strategy, the method of making something vis-a-vis -vis the thing. And I'm most interested in the things I don't know what they're gonna become. It's what keeps me up at night. I'm, I'm operating on something and I'm not sure where it's going and that's the point. Um, I don't know, maybe in a very kind of simple way. Um, I've always loved being lost in a city because being lost is when you're the most observant you, you, you're the most kind of aware when you're, when you're right, you're trying to find your way through something. And it's in a way parallel to that, that I, I'm putting myself in a position of, of some sort of lostness, right? As I find my way through it, but I'm dependent on the operational strategy to take me there and not on facility, not on my ability to do this, right? And I guess it's also a, in a way, it's a, a critique on that 
um, ability that I'm not totally trusting in facility only in talent, which you'd call talent, right? And um, and then of course with that comes from the very beginning of my practice a question of the the authenticity of the work, and I've instinctually kind of thought of work as collective, not personal. Um, and it's um, started with the, actually the naming of my firm, Morphosis, and it came directly from a kind of an era that I was in that formed me. And it was this the the the, the it was the Archigram Boys and, and, and Super Studio, et cetera, when there was a, it was in the air, this notion of the collective. And, and, and it was challenging authorship at the same time as a, as a kind of a secondary kind of an event. <clears throat> anyway, I'm going to, um, and, I'm, mm, and I'm now inventing these things. And there's something here that's going to be really crucial. <clears throat> I'm starting with 3D. And the drawing comes afterwards as a CAT scan as a way of describing the thing I made. And so the drawing is no longer um, the, the event that's producing the work, right? It starts from a 3D event. And I'm gonna show you a series of organizations and uh, I wish we had some more time and I could draw. I'm with the other, I'll go here and we just had lunch and I'm drawing. The things I'm gonna show you, um, they're all made out of four elements. They're really simple. There, there's an XY line, a Z line, an object and a surface. And they all fit on a site, which is, I, I use purposely a Cartesian, a square, that's it. So they have the identical DNA matter. And what I'm interested in is the variation and the, the, um, the degree of variation I can get out of this extremely simple language. And if we, again, if we had more time, it would be Miles Davis or it'd be Thelonious Monk or, or Herbie Hancock discussing the very edge of, of, of dissonant music requires huge organizational ideas and it includes simplicity to produce that kind of complexity, right? To find your way through the maze, right? You have to have very clear rules. And then, but what would, would be really important here that I've taken for granted sometimes is the drawings are now CAT scans. They're multiple sections of this thing you're looking at and they're coming afterward and they're used more like a, 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 a surgeon doing a cardiac pulmonary work the way they, they map your, your left chamber, then it would be the way architects work. It's now describing under different terms the nature of what you can't see as you cut through this thing because you can only see a surface effect. And then what you're gonna look at now are these variations that I've got, I don't know, 25 here. Um, I have to say as a subtext, since we don't have more time and I'm to scoot you really quickly, I'm gonna show you quite a few of them, but I would say one of the things that we're gonna share, Stephen and I, is about intensity. And it, it takes, I think, um, for me, it's absolutely important that you, you approach your work with some threshold of intensity that absolutely is essential to the nature of that final piece. And so if it looks obsessive, and maybe it is, and maybe it should be, um, I'm looking now, and each one of these things is made out of the same thing. And I'm producing very, very different organizational types Right, and um, I'm producing maybe a, a, out of this uh, simple DNA pattern a species, and I want something that's as diverse as a fox and a zebra and a, and a, a lizard. Right, and um, and I'm 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 discussing these in terms of their differentiation. I'm making my own discretionary changes of these, and I'm observing them myself in terms of the nature of their um, their organization that comes from these elements. And of course, as we keep looking at these, they can maybe simpler and simpler that you can recognize these four elements that are keep repeating in very different combinational orders and in terms of different densities and et cetera. And again, the drawing becomes now uh, a part of an analytical tool, but it offer, off, offers another kind of vision as architects in terms of their future usefulnesses. And I should say also <clears throat> that's what's important in this is I completely separate away from any of the contingencies of architecture. I'm not fettered by client demands, cost considerations, technological issues, site, et cetera. I'm operating separate from that. And it's extremely important I do that to allow for some sort of a purity of this, this kind of research I'm looking for as an architect. And I separated myself from my studio to do this. And at some point, um, I'm going to reach a threshold, and um, I made a decision 
that um, I've basically w gone through an enormous kind of range of options and I've saturated the project. And you can see that um, in part of the operational strategy is the definition of the site. And some of their differences aren't the nature of the, the four components, but they're also the way they operate in defining the site. And that one of the rules is that it had to define all five surfaces of, of the site. And the differences are gonna be definitely site driven. And I guess at that level, I am operating as an architect, not a painter or a sculptor, right? Then I'm very aware that this is very much connected to how I work, right? And the look, the location of, um, the notion of location, a place is gonna be something that, I, that is always present in my architectural work. And then um, I'm gonna start thinking about the, the reorganization of the drawings and what the model, um, how the model is useful to me three-dimensionally. And of course now it's gonna be much closer to um, work as an architect in, in terms of its three-dimensionality and in terms of its um, materiality, its substance. <clears throat> and it has to operate and, in, in terms of gravity and in the typical ways that we have to deal with in architecture. And I'm looking at the drawings in terms of their organizational possibilities. And then I stopped and did, a, these are a series of prints. <clears throat> I'm now putting um, various separate organizations, I'm interacting to make yet more complex organizations, which are gonna be um, in my mind, something possibly interesting in my urban work. And they're going to be very much interested in scalar relationships. So we could go in and look at just one little piece on the bottom right corner and find another whole world, right? In terms of the um, kind of the interest in the, the complexity of these, these organizations. And then um, for the sake of the discussion we were going to have here with the, the six of you, I'm going to show something much more kind of literal and make a, a direct connection. The work I'm showing in the beginning, there's fragments of these interests, but they're hugely driven by the realities of architecture, all the contingent behavior, right? And of course, what I'm trying to do in these organizations is produce something that's loaded with contingency and complexity that already deals with that because that's, that's what I deal with as an architect. And now I'm going to show you these drawings and look at something very specifically and I don't know what you want, want to call it, it's just an organizational diagram. And unlike, again, its classic predecessor, it's extremely relaxed in its relationships. Instead of demanding any literal, formal, compositional strategies, it, it has much more to do with that cell I showed you, of the onion skin. I can produce more or less infinite numbers of these, and they, they, they operate, let's quote, aesthetically. Right? I'm not married to, there's no, um, I guess part of this exercise is challenging the notion of ideal. That ideal as an idea is, I would have said, is, 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 um, is, is antiquated. And then again, just because we're architects, I'm gonna translate that for you in terms of the various layering, which is parallel to the layering of the things I'm showing you. There's five here instead of four, and that leads to this. And it gives me some of the same diversity and it gives me the, the back and forth the willfulness and chance. So this element comes out of the strategy. It's not me. It's just a selection of these things interacting. And I'm just saying, I'm making the discretionary decision, no different than if I'm drawing and saying, this is one, not that one, right? But I'm not actually producing it. It's coming, it, it's, a, it's a product of the strategy. Mm. And it allows the kind of diversity and the kind of complexity and the um, an implied randomness. But again, um, like the drawings, I'm really interested in the, um, and like a piece of music, the tension between the look of release or um, chaos or uh, contingency or randomness and its relationship to the form of control and the tension between those two things operating together. And the, the radical diversity that I need to accomplish the, the spatial differentiation I need for the various diversity of the programs. 
that take place in day-to-day -day life. And then at an urban level, again, it'd be now, it'd be lecture number two, would be a discussion that it seems to be even more useful as the problems increase in, in, in intensity and in, um, in specificity of, of, of um, and breadth of program. And it's going to be more useful as, um, as architects now were asked to develop big increments of city making in incredibly ridiculously short periods of time. So this is a competition we won that we had um, three months to design an, an element of the city that's no longer a building as part of an accretional event. It's a, um, a, a, a complete district, or in this case, maybe four districts of the city. How many square meters? And it's your, um, oh my God. 450,000 square meters. That's what I'm gonna guess. Something like that. Yeah. Something, yeah, it's, a, it's a done even. 4.5 million square feet. Okay. Ah, ah, wait a minute, I got it. Okay, now, okay. Number two, um, the pieces I was showing you, uh, we're gonna start now the next event. And what happened, uh, I've been working on those for about five years. And again, I kind of scoot to my own private studio and I work on those separate from my, my, uh, my, my design studio, my architectural studio. Um, last year, um, we started looking at those and discussing the, the reality of the in, infinite number of possibilities of things I showed you, because I was talking about it and said, yes, um, there are infinite numbers. I, I stopped at 26 and I'm just kind of out of energy and I thought I showed a broad range of options. And now um, we scripted that and uh, whoop. And I can literally show you an infinite number and I'm stopping at a hundred because there's no reason to go past that, all right? And I can increase the intention of these changes um, as we get more sophisticated in writing the scripting. And <clears throat> um, again, I wish I could see you personally. I would be, if I was your age, really interested in this. Why? We're gonna need about a 10th of you. This is done in one day by a person that I've worked with for a couple of years that did the that worked on the first ones, right? And then I could take the next one. That's another day and they're infinite. And I'm looking at um, this incredible, uh, this increased possibility of making discriminatory acts. That's all we do, right? We make something, we have, we discriminate, we, we, we have some sort of a conversation with that thing and we change it, we do it again, right? And it's this reiterative process and it's gonna change radically as these techniques become more and more um, kind of available, right? And as more of you are involved at this kind of level. And again, um, you would have to go back to those first models I showed you, the 26 models and look at each one at a time. Even the production of the physical thing took a week on those, right? The, the thing itself maybe was a, a three or four day project but it's um, gonna have huge kind of effect on our work. And then um, like I did with the, uh, the giant project, I'm gonna give you an idea of those applications. So now I'm taking that system we have and I have a project in, um, in Ningbo. We're doing uh, uh, three pavilions in a park and I can produce um, variations as well as um, organizational kind of ideas that allow me to go somewhere that um, connects to this, this strategy, right? And that it gives me enormous kind of options that, um, and I can work in a, a fairly quick pace because I'm operating very systematically I love and I can produce something quite complicated, but I can direct but, the, but ru simple. the rules of it's that. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> I started, ah, I uh, got another one going, interesting. Uh, I started with the square oh, yes. on the drawings and I did that purposely to make convention. Mm -hmm. That was the conventional part. And I started with a cube on this one and I'm not happy with it now. The next one, we're gonna go to work on the next series. Let me show this you the right. beautiful, don't, don't and, throw and, that away. It's and, so, and so here we go again and here are the CAT scans, right? They're now architectural CAT scans. And that's the, ah, on the upper left, that's the plan. And um, what's interesting, it's now coming between drawing and work, it's, it's this kind of middle ground, it's this transition between an abstract drawing, there it is, as it becomes a literal plan. 
And then, okay, I'm drawing it architecturally now, the way architects draw it. I shouldn't be showing this. I'm, I'm, I'm prostituting my, or I'm doing something that's kind of a convention that I shouldn't be worth. And so this is number two. Nice. And again, the options are gonna be infinite as I produce this stuff. And I'm, um, I can right. control the DNA just like I did in the drawings. I have like four elements I'm using here that I'm putting together. And um, I have, I've actually redone these already. There's already a second generation of these and they're quite different. And um, they're, they're getting even, I think they're getting a little stronger, but I have kind of a system to produce these things. And that system, by the way, is collective. It's not me. It's a conversation with one of you. We're working together and we understand the goal of the project and we understand the rules Right, we we understand the method that we're we're going to talk about, and then we're trying to we're trying to move forward at the same time. And we can use the drawings as they're useful to us, etc. Because again, like the CAT scan, we're going to produce something of huge variation. There's no section that's identical, of course, because of the complexity of the organization and because of the relational nature of the interaction of things. Right. So the, the sections literally can be cut at whatever you're interested is in terms of the level of specificity that you're interested in in terms of that delta. Okay, La I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it here and, it, and maybe I'll start a conversation because it's, um, uh, we, we draw a lot and we just, um, we think visually and um, I've been working on just intuitively on sketchbooks and I, I just I, I work on just visual language from the very beginning. And um, I don't necessarily in these cases, it's like chance behavior. I'm not aware of even what I'm drawing. I'm using stuff around me. I'm probably in Akamal and Yucatan when I'm doing this one. And I'm using maybe certain natural things around me, but I'm just absorbing things and I'm putting them in my own private language. <clears throat> and I'm not thinking necessarily. I'm working as um, intuitively as possible. And I'm trying to, if anything, shut off my, my brain, right? And it'd be very, again, I, I think in some ways I, I connect much more to musicians than I do to architects. Then I think architects think too much and it gets in their way. and. Um, any really serious musician will tell you that the first thing you have to do when you really take off is shut off your brain. And it takes a little time to even do that. There's kind of a rigor to do that. Although, eh, um, clearly, uh, uh, the, 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 I guess painting, you could, you, could have, you could come up with a whole group of people, but certainly Dada. And again, that'd be another separate conversation. It'd be interesting because the, a lot of stuff we're talking about in terms of change goes right to Dada and it'd be right after the Duchamp stuff. And it'd be another kind of beginning of the another beginning of the conversation. And then um, what I've done now is I'm starting another set of drawings, and I'm challenging the four elements I use, which are these primitive elements of, of X, Y line, Z line, object, and surface. <clears throat> and I'm now producing a series of um, of sketches which are exquisite corpse-like. You know, exquisite, you put down a line and you put down another line. And I, I forced myself to make a sketch within 45 minutes. And then I put it away and make another one. And through memory of some of those pieces, um, there are gonna be some similarity. And then I put them together. And I'm using this as my base information for another set of works. And I'm reinventing the, the primitives. And then I start working with them, but uh, you draw something and then draw something else and you, you're, you have no place to go. It's total chance behavior. And as the thing develops, you keep responding to the thing you have and you decide when to end it. You decide when it's finished, you decide all the kind of rules of this, this, this chance thing. And you're working very, very quickly and very simply. Um, I did 200 of these in, I don't know, a month. And um, they're um, a 314 pencil on a piece of paper and that's it, no devices. The shape is actually a book and it's just they're, they're, they're completely simple. And again, I'm looking for the kind of diversity that comes from me now, not the computer. And it's interesting because it's been a tough crit. Uh, the other, we were discussing this at lunch, not comfortable compared to the stuff I showed you on the computer. 
I'm like going, oh, can't get there on my own, right? That it has the ability of these connect these connections goes way beyond my potential. What Kessler says, you can deal with seven things simultaneously and I'm stuck at that seven. And the, the digital world I'm working with deals with apparently hundreds of thousands or something. But I'm gonna take, this is now the derivation of the work. And again, um, in terms of rigor, even, especially to 200 until I just fall on my face until you just can't get any further and we're gonna share that completely. It's gotta be a complete obsession. You're right? looking at 60,000 watercolors. <laughs> 60, I know, I know well, I have some of them I could add to that. Uh, that came as Christmas gifts or whatever, or birthday gifts. And, um, but it's gonna be the derivation. And then I'm gonna develop a language now to communicate that within the digital world. And I'm gonna develop a new, um, a, a new vocabulary. And in this case, it's gonna have seven, um, it's, it, there'd be, no, there's four, uh, it's an a, a through D. And as I put those together, you're gonna have the, um, the residual of the marks that made the thing. It's gonna be equivalent to my hand in a way. And so if I got rid of the thing and just showed you the thing that made the thing, right? Both um, Serlio's hidden lines, if you're into history, right? Um, I'm gonna show you the elements that made the thing as the thing. And now you're looking just at process. You're looking at the organizational idea without the thing, right? And I'm just asking questions. And then uh, again, I'm trying to get unstuck from the four primitives that I used. I'm now translating, ooh, ooh, I knew this wasn't, it's not on. The light didn't go on. Whatever I'm plugged into here, I'm about to lose my, hmm. lights, lights not on. Hmm. I'm gonna lose power, guys. Should we switch? Yeah, just switch. Should we switch pieces and see if it goes on? <laughs> Says low battery, stop here. Okay, I'm going back now. I'm just about done, guys. I'm going back to my primitives and I'm I'm challenging. Ah, I told him thanks. Okay. We're good. I'm challenging the limits of those primitives that you could finally, if I went through those 26 things I showed you, right? The, the strange yeah. networks, they, there was a self similarity language because it does come from the same four primitives that had three variations, which you don't care. It's another, another topic. And so now I've taken a Yukio e-print and it happens to be just a really uh, woodblock um, middle of the, the 19th century. And um, it happens to be a, just an extremely beautiful piece. I've been not showing to you, but you have to believe me. And it's, it's, it's a, um, uh, it was called the, the, the Tour of Hell by the Water Margin Heroes, et cetera. And I'm using that as the basis. And I'm now using my translated language to produce something else. And, and of course what's taking place is it's a figurative drawing. And now what's coming through is that primitive. And I'm looking at the power of the operational strategy that deforms the original thing, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of deciding kind of where to go in this next work. And I'm looking at different variations of that, of that operation. And you can see the lines again that are my um, language as I translate this, this painting. And then I took um, Picasso's Guernica as a given. And again, I went through uh, the, my own operational strategy. And interesting here, a lot of it becomes much more literal because he's using a platonic language. It was really interesting as, a, as a, just an analytical device of, uh, of Picasso. And then um, taking the drawings I showed you through um, the digital kind of world. And again, including um, the translation to another language. And I'm now just asking questions. I'm showing you something no one will see that this is my critique of the drawings I started showing you with the Dwaddles. <clears throat> and I'm now just asking questions having to do with the, um, the origin vis-a-vis -vis the, the broader operational strategy. And um, that's now coming from my own sketches. And I'm asking those kind of questions, but it clearly, uh, the, 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 the beginning of the conversation would start with the, the radical differentiation in um, complexity and variation, and I would have said sophistication 
if I'm going to put this next to one of those original drawings, which is going to take me somewhere because I'm, 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 I'm interested in the location of my own personal hand in this or my role in this project within more traditional terms. All of this, if it makes sense to you, uh, would go back. I wanted to show one more thing and I can't, um, but the, the ones where I use this directly connected to a piece of work that I can discuss, um, I can locate my own processes of um, my own creative processes. And again, it's I, my first comment to you, I think was, uh, I, the, the thing that I assume you're the most interested in this part of your life is understanding and locating the nature of your own creative methods. And strangely enough, I'm teaching various places. I'm kind of startled how few people don't or can't articulate their own creativity. Mm -hmm. It somehow just, it exists, but they, they literally can't articulate it. Cause I would have said that is your job at the moment of deciding, um, who you are as an architect and you locate yourself in terms of your values. And it would go back to the very beginning. It would be, for instance, the relationship between an operational strategy which challenges figuration or typology. It's gonna differentiate you right away, right? And so I'm trying to resist figuration. I'm trying to resist typological instincts. I'm trying to move someplace that, that's outside of that which would be, I would have said, a continuation of the modern project. <clears throat> and I'm trying to be useful in identifying that with you in terms of these, these, um, these ideas. And it definitely would have to do with an interest in operational strategies that aren't intuitive, that aren't just do a little this and do a little that, that is gonna be something much more rigorous. And again, um, you guys are deciding kind of which things are interesting to you and which are not, because we all work very differently. Because I would have said, again, I don't know if we have time to talk, because I would have yeah, said, wanted... Steve and I are quite opposite in a lot of ways, right. but we're very similar in our commitment and our rigor and the energy and the uh, the extent of our, of our uh, the way we work in terms of its um, um, kind of the sheer kind of energy level that we commit to the work and et cetera. But I'd have said in terms of the location of the work, you'd be looking at, and it, sh it should be what's useful working with different people. You'd be working with people that are interested in very different directions in architecture. Right. That we're defining. Um, and again, it seems like one of these that's so interesting with you guys right now at this particular time is there's no dominant notion of what architecture is or how it's produced. It's a question mark. In fact, it'd be a great time to start a school right now. Well, I guess that's what Steve is doing. <laughs> Just, uh, it's a six-person uh, school. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, I think the question is, is where are you located today? Because there seems to be an immense breadth in what people call architecture. And you have to find it. <clears throat> you, you could say it's a problem, but I think it's actually an opportunity. It places you in a position that you have to choose just instinctively. And by the way, you only have your instinct. If I look backwards, I had no idea what I was doing. Just this, just find your way through it and you operate in what seems to make sense to you and you'll figure it out 10 years after that. You'll go, okay, I get it now. When I looked at that onion cell, not a clue. I saw it in the book, I copied it. I'd used it in every lecture since I was 30 years old. And I had no idea. I, I, like, this, I like this image. It's filled with stuff that I wanna work with. And here I am 77. And then making drawings that have some connection to that in terms of their um, the variation, the complexity, the density of what is instilled in that in that cellular photograph, right? Ditto with Nazga and the work I showed you in, in, in Senjin. And so you just have to find your way through it through your own instincts. There's, there's no other choice, right? But you have choices and, you, and that's the good news right? You have definite distinct places you can go right now in terms of what you feel comfortable with. And if you're interested in maintaining more convention, obviously you, you, you pursue that as something that you're interested in architecture, which has more convention than it's, it's, it's a scale too, of course, that you're interested in something that, that, that um, is more harmonious with the way we live and changes, let's say, incrementally. Ah, it might come down to your your essence, your sense of change in terms of you personally and your generation. 
And it would be the, the, the degree of acceleration you're comfortable with. I'd have said that is the singular issue in this country, if you're in the States right now, it might be global, would be where you stand politically, culturally, socially, would probably have to do with your comfort with the rate of change, right? And as you move more and more to keep things the way they are, you're moving obviously politically to the political spectrum. And as you're more comfortable with an incredibly rapid change, you're moving to the politically liberal side. But there's this enormous kind of range with this comfort, right? And um, I would think it would have a huge amount to do with just where you are, you stand personally in terms of that, that comfort level. And there's no right or wrong. It's just you, right? I'll end with that. Stephen. I would say, you know, what's really exciting is to have Tom's talk, which I really like because it really explored the subjective side of trying to be an architect. I mean, we agree on one thing, two things that we agree on, and that is the, the role of intuition and the role of a profound interest and obsession to get somewhere, right? But we start from opposite. I start, I try to start with a verbal idea, a concept that drives the design. So I'm, when I'm working in these little sketchbooks, in fact, some of the work is a little bit like Tom's, but I, I don't have a square, I have a five by seven. And I'm usually, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to write a sentence or two that gives me a verbal, uh, a verbal grasp of what it is like, for example, when I did the, the, the project in Maggie's uh, Cancer Care Center, and I said, a thing within a thing within a thing. So there's a, there's a bamboo basket kind of interior, there's a concrete hand, and there's a musical score that surrounds it. So I, I need, for me, I need that sentence, uh, that verbal, uh, ah, it's, okay. I need it. So, you know, we, that, so for all our lives, we've disagreed about the <laughs> beginning point, right? He okay. says he doesn't want any thinking at we're, all. I say I have to have a thought to worse, get. No, worse than that. The thing you're looking at right now on the screen, what I, what you can do artistically through the visual communication is not describable in words. There's, I agree with that. There's by nothing way. I can say other than what I told you, talking around the thing and its origins that have anything to do with this. It has its own private, unique language through a visual world, right? And so for me, there's nobody, I could care less what people say about this or what they talk about it. They can make it into anything they want, et cetera. That's their business, not my business. And I'm interested in the, the, the nature of what, can, what, can't, hmm, what can't be communicated, right? See, and it's I, made I, it I difficult for me to talk about the work because I'm, I'm very, hmm, I don't believe in that. I think See. it has its own world that's, um, would be no different than music. You have to Try describe to describe it. Miles Davis. It, you listen to it. It's, you can't describe it. You could talk about sketches it. in Spain. I can describe Miles Davis sketches in Spain. It's one of the most amazing they, works I, of the solo trumpet. You could talk around it. You can't talk about it. I'm it's talking just, about it. It's touching you. No, it, it's made you. I, I the feel like I'm out your there heart shift. on the plains of Spain in the heat listening to that trumpet go and then it slows down it gets almost as if the sun got too hot and he's going to sleep in the middle of the piece sketches of spain you, miles you, davis you're, but is, you're describing it you're not talking about it well you're describing around it right you're giving it characteristics right it can only be absorbed on its own terms right it's an it's this an architecture huh i would i would claim that our work at the, at the level we're talking about subjectively, and the drawings are only understood by broad sensory, multiple senses in terms of architecture, auditory, oral, visual, obviously, that you walk into Chart and you go straight from Chart to La Tourette and you go, oh, I get it. Corb really got Chart. And it starts with smell and atmosphere, etc. Forget the visual. The color, way overly the visual. Light. And you go, okay, he got it. The space. We know exactly where he came from. And I, I remember when the first time I was there, I was probably your age. Um, I'd seen a thousand photographs of, 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 of uh, Lavalette. And I walked in like I'd never seen it. I go, oh, 
and I'm, I'm young still, and I'm starting to figure out, oh, this is what architecture is. You actually, you can't look at photographs. You can't you read. Yeah. You can't read Frampton or who the fuck I was reading at the time. You have to actually go there and sleep there or just hang out in the chapel. And you go, yeah. okay, now I get it. This is what architecture can, this is how it can speak. But it, it speaks its own unique language as an art form that only architecture speaks. That it's not literature. It's not connected to drawing or painting. It's not connected to tectonics or engineering. It's this, it's, it's this own thing that only speaks. Because I had a claim you can't talk about your buildings. You can talk about them. You can talk around them. You finally, they have their own thing that only can be experienced. Let's, let's see. Active architect. Arini, this is, we have a kind of format where there's each of the six students gets to ask something. Oh, can, we, can we, yeah. can you direct that? Absolutely, yes. Let's, uh, we can, so from our residents, you can, um, there are questions already coming in into the chat and the Q&A, but I would like to open it up to our panelists first. Right. Uh, I was going to ask about, because you said the two things that you guys agree on, um, I can understand the rigor um, and I can see it in both the work, obviously, but I guess the role of intuition if you could elaborate on how you have a connection there, because I feel like this talk, this lecture from Tom sort of is not interested in intuition, or I guess I can't clearly see how you are um, how you are translating this in, in, with your intuition after this procedural logic that you're going through. I think it's May. very I think it's very much about intuition. I mean, I start every day at at, at six o'clock in the morning making a watercolor on a five by seven pad without a, a pre you know a priori idea. And I, I look at what I'm doing and then I write a sentence. Okay. In other words, I'm not saying I have an a priori, so that I'm using my intuition to even get started. So, you, you know, one of the things about making anything is you're faced with a big white sheet of paper and you put, you know, you start to sweat and the beads of sweat hit the paper and you put a dot on the page. You you did hey. something, you put a dot there. And I think hey, he man, does the same thing. Didn't you ask me the question? <laughs> oh, I thought you asked me. I thought she asked me. I'm open to both. Megan, oh, I, 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 I can't talk to you about intuition because it's... um. It's DNA. And so uh, to ask the question, it's a complex question to ask because you something you own from birth. Mm -hmm. It's something that is there or it's not there. That, that, the type of intuition, whatever type of intuition you're talking about. And so I would assume that the, everything I've done is based on intuition or based on a certain facility visually. Otherwise, I couldn't do this. And, but it's not something that's really discursive because it's not something you can change. It, it exists. And I would have said what you're, part of the process of, of your education is determining your own sense of your intuitive potential and where you're gonna move in architecture because you can move way into the rational side into the more um, what conventional thinking within, um, especially within an academic world, within the, the, the rational left instead of right thing. But other than that, it just exists. Mm. And there's nothing I can say. Um, I look at this and um, I'm a completely intuitive person. These are these devices that help me. And, but I could do this when I was six years old, just not in this form. I it never changed. You are who you are. You just, you, you, you're going to figure out, right? Whatever intuition, meaning the, the total of your existence in terms of some creative act is, I don't know how you define it, right? But you've got to do it. Just, in other words, you've yeah. got to do it. In other words, when, when my five-year-old daughter draws, she, get, she gets something, she finds something. And unless you draw, unless you make, you won't know what, what's inside of you. You do it. Doing it is part of the, part of the pulling it out of, of the creative effort. So make things, make more drawings, you, you discard them. I'm gonna show you a series of five sculptures I made out of COVID boxes. You know, they kept delivering all the food in COVID boxes. So I said, what am I gonna do with this cardboard? So I started to cut it up and I started to make all these sculptures 
and they're all pinned up on the wall and I'm going to throw them away because I don't really like them. But I did five gigantic or seven, like these big constructions out of the COVID boxes. I did not throw the cardboard away and I made things with my glue and my mat knife and I made things, you know. And I, yeah, I, I, I'm, we have this one image of this thing on the, on the computer. You see it? And we, again, we had a, a much longer conversation earlier in this um, about this work. And I'm looking at this now, and this is what I'm doing, by the way. On this one, compared to the first one, the first one, there's a lot of mechanical stuff happening with the, the digital world. And I'm a little uncomfortable whether, I, whether it's too much control by the digital world. And mm -hmm. I'm going back, this and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find me in it again in a very conventional way, which I guess relates to the intuition. And I'm looking at this now, and I'm, I, I haven't looked at these myself very long. I, I tend to move really quickly. And as I look at these, um, nice. and as I look at it's this, safe, I'm, right? I'm kind of happier with it. <laughs> and I'm going, no, I am moving forward. And it's a drawing I could not do without going through exercises with the computer that I couldn't invent this, because I invented this. This is nothing. This is a white piece of paper, right? And, and this was something that, that came out of, um, it, it, it is only intuition. It operates, it doesn't do anything. Right? It you speaks know, a, a language that no one speaks. I can talk right? about it. You want me to talk about it? There was a painter in the Pacific Northwest called Mark Toby. And during the 50s, he invented a thing called white writing. Mark Toby's you can look it up on the, I'm, I'm sure you can Google it and you can find it. And he became really famous because at that moment, Jackson Pollock was throwing paint on the canvas and Mark Toby was taking a very delicate white lines like those here. And the, they called it, it was abstract expressionism was, you know, the king and, you know, and they called it white writing. And he became a very famous painter making white writing. And I, when I look at that, I, I thought, especially here, it's like Mark Toby's you know, effort uh, on the canvases. It's funny because I'm, I'm, I was aware making this that I'm using white as a color. No, it's great. I purposely muddy, I this, muddied the this background. This part here, the lower right hand square, that's, is, yeah. that's, that's, the, the, that's the intense part. I, I agree, I, I, we're agreement. <laughs> So no, that's does that help? Does that have Megan? This last conversation? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. This exactly. is the one that's actually so looking at what you're talking here's, about. Here's here's another thing that happens when he does something really good. <laughs> you can't. We talk. both agree. We <laughs> both agree. If he does something kind of crappy, I tell him. You know? And the same thing happens this way, right? So why do we agree on what? What is the what is the factor that's causing us to agree on certain things? Those cubes that you're doing in then Ningbo are some of the best work you've ever done. Yeah. Those subtractive cubes. Who's the one that's doing the subtractive in our group, in our six? Um, Jack. Right, yeah. Jack, yes. Is he there? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. OK, great, yeah. So that operation that you were working with earlier today is, is he's doing it. He's doing the subtractive operation on these cubes is tremendous. You know, uh, and it's uh, and it keeps going. It's you know, so yeah. There are two questions from the audience. Do you like to take one now? Actually, uh, can I ask a follow-up question right before the audience? Sure. Yes, Jack. Right. Uh, so when you talk oh, Brian, about sorry, computer, yes. computer aid, I uh, I go to a school at Carnegie Mellon, and I'd say the majority of the school, these people are obsessed with the idea of machine learning. And uh, some of the architecture teachers will have like a robotic arm, like I guess learn how to make like an abstract painting. And then we'll ask the student, you know, uh, which was painted by like a person and which was painted by a computer that, that was just like uh, generated to learn, I guess like an intuition of its own. Like, how do you feel towards, towards that idea of if like the work is still produces some sort of in intuition, some sort of language with like multiple copies and iterations, but it's by like a computer and not someone's intuition at all. Like where does that line kind of draw or blur for like your practice or like your lots of studies where you have like- you know, um, and then it's an interesting question. Um, and it's something that, that I've thought about definitely in the work I'm showing you. Um, Pollock um, in 1944, went from touching the paintbrush to the canvas and what looked like paintings that were thrown to not touching the paintbrush and throwing them right there in the Guggenheim in Venice. <clears throat> and there's two of the last 
Beatty said they were traditional and two that he threw it. And then you now look at Pollock and then he did that for whatever, the next five, six years. You now look at them and they just about look mechanical. And I, I look at them now and you realize like, like a basketball player, muscle memory. He's using his arm and he's doing this, right? And he's doing it so accurately that you look at the work and you, it's hard to believe. Well, it was only less, a little over 10 years later, 15 years later, um, Rebecca Horn is making the machine in the corner of the space that's throwing the paint. And it's his arm that's throwing it, right? Uh, this, it gets actually a, a little messier, a little more uh, a, a chance encounter actually than his arm. Because strangely enough, is again, go back and look at one of his paintings. It's so accurate. It's kind of amazing now. You look and he could actually do that. It's just, in terms of what we call chance now, in terms of what I'm showing you, it's, it, it's very, very mechanical with his arm. I think these are just tools. And whether, whether Holt throws it with her apparatus in a white studio or whether you're using various apparatuses, it's just a delivery system, but find it has to do with your intent, kind of the notion of the idea of the work itself. What are you trying to produce? What are you trying to talk about? Ah, so I guess I do. I am interested, obviously, in meaning for sure. For sure. Um, and that it has some sort of a narrative. It has a meaning that you're exploring something. Um, the machine's not gonna help you. It doesn't do anything. You get the order to do something. What's happening in a lot of academic work right now, which, which I'm really worried about, is that you're working off prescribed programs and somebody did it, not you. They wrote the program. Right. So if all of your work tends to look more alike, of course it does. One group of people wrote the program. It'd be as if I just took the drawings I showed you and used the same four primitives and gave that as a, a studio, which I've done. I'm gonna get work that's gonna be connected to what you can get out of differencing in terms of a, 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 a strategy, a, 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 a connective strategy, and those four primitives that I used, of course. That's why I'm even looking at it. I, I've abandoned it, I'm looking for where do I go now is I have to challenge the primitives or the processes of how they connect. There's only two things I can, I can do. And I think what you're looking at, I, I think with the, the, the mechanics is they're, um, they're depending on prescribed things and that's, not going to help you a lot at some point. Architecture is too um, too specific, and requires um, specific thinking. That and that self similarity is not going to do any good in terms of uh, differentiating yourself. Why me and not the other person? <laughs> and finally, it comes down to what? Are you, where are you in the equation? What do you offer? Right. And now we're just talking about thinking, and whether it's intuitive or whether it's more rational, it still has to do with your conscious thought of how you use the tools because it is just a tool. You make simple models and you go to a, a saw or a drill or you pick up the thing that's just useful based on some intention of kind of where you want to go. It's no different than that. And if you're, if you're quote, more creative, you kind of even re reinvent how those tools are used and decide, oh, I can actually, I can cut a line with a drill, but I'd have to do it like a lot of little holes and then break it. And you're going to get a different, feeling of that break, then you've used a saw and you'd go, I get it. I'm right. I'm now challenging the nature of a tool that does one thing and I'm going to use it to do something else. Tales the tools. They're just tools. All right. Um, and if they, if they overwork for you, I guess I asked that in this question here, start looking for where, what you're involved in, in the project. How do you kind of challenge that now that um, over prescriptive stuff that's going, you know, in traditional architecture, it'd be no different. You study under a certain person. And if you were at SC when I went to school and studied with Craig Atwood, it, everything looks like Mies van der Rohe. And you draw with ink and it's all Cartesian. And, it's, and structure becomes primary. Everybody starts with structure and relationship and detail. I, actually, if anything, I think it's more open now. In fact, if, if anything, your problem is novelty. Too much, too much difference in, in a thin way. What I said is the biggest problem. You can do anything. And because you can do anything, you can't do anything. Right. And I, I remember a professor of mine that said, if you can't think of what to make it, make it a square. And guess what? That's what Tom does. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had a question, if, if, uh, mm -hmm. if I can jump in. Um, First, uh, seeing you seeing you two discussing is like extremely encouraging. I'm an older architecture student. I'm 38, 
And so I, I hope to have your, have your virility years and your, <laughs> your intensity. Um, and, uh, but my question comes, comes down to how do you communicate the complexity? What you showed us today, showed us today so many, the devices that you've created that, that are a creative act and then analyze, analyzing the act and then selecting subjective selections of those things. How do you communicate that architecture? I find that every time that I come to try to synthesize a lot of different insp inspiration, um, I'm always told to reduce and reduce and reduce. That's how and you do it, right there. You do it through the work. And I can only arrive there through the way I work, like any architect. And um, this, for an architect, you have to have someone that agrees that they're interested in this. If you don't, then don't worry about it. <laughs> Just right. And by the way, there are not that many people interested in this, but enough to keep me going. All right. And um, yeah, we're but, an endangered but, species. We're but endangered I can, species. I can, I can through everything I talked to you about, I can produce this, and this, and this, and that. Wow. Wow. And where is that? In in, in Nanjing. This is a great project. And I Nanjing. had to do this in four months. And it's 2 million square feet and it's wow. a big building and you can see, and it finally is somewhat complex. This is nothing compared to, I could keep going on this one. It has a certain complexity that operates on kind of a lot of different levels. But that's and, another thing, and, that's and, a different thing. And this is, and it needs variation. It's not, if I took you around the whole building there, there's going to be a hundred different little pieces I could show you. But this is not and whether it operates at this scale, at this scale. No, wait, 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 go back. I want to know about this building. That building, the one that you were showing is, is that, that Nanjing. That, this is new. This is a brand new. Yeah. This is a different building. No, no, of course. I've been in the one where he pulled the core out. No, no, this, the, this, is, another, this is another building. Altogether. That's in Shenzhen. Yeah, this is a, another. But again, um, it, it gives me the, the qualities that I'm looking for in, in large scale, especially large scale work. That, well, that allows me where you to pull the core out of the tower. So I, I have oh. to say that, you know, I don't know how he got there, but oh, it gives not, me, it gives, you know, it's yeah. not without it the gives, way that you could speak about it because he took a normal, a normal office tower, you know, and he pulled the freaking core out. Oh, oh, and so you have to go on a bridge okay. on every floor right. to get to the, I've been there. I've been inside of it. So no, that's not something that's completely right. without some absolute right. uh, in, insisting right, thought. That, yeah, you have to argue that to the client. Right. You have to pull it, the whole core out of the building? Right. But uh, Reginald, it gives me this also, right? Mm. I'm looking for very different things at different work. And then as Steve is saying, that is this amazing. is a very, very simple building. And, and it was, yeah, I, was I, like trying, I was trying to get out of form because all these shapes are just boring, beyond boring. Yeah. And I'm like, knowing what it's really about is this. He pulled the core out. When you go from your domestic world to your work world in the morning and night, that's looking You walk across, everybody you has to cross a bridge. You walk across a bridge and you're, you're involved in the city. There's no core in the main tower. And you walk across you a 50 foot that. glass bridge and you get this. You're in the that's city. That's a radical. And point. so this is actually more phenomenological than it is about form purposely. Yeah. And it was, a, it, was, it was a decision very early on. Experience. Let's yeah. not focus on form. Let's, 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 go, let's talk about the phenomena of the building because form to us is kind of boring on this particular building type as everybody's doing it. Yeah, they're doing really it, ugly twists. Is this like a, is this a, a particular building? Is it half residential and half commercial? No, is that? No, it's, it's an building. office building. Okay. I'm just curious with that. Very simple. One of the simplest buildings you'll ever do. It's Except just the experience is unique because you go up and you cross into a bridge yeah. in space to get to every floor. Yeah, and the stuff I'm showing you is much more connected to uh, something where I need language in a stronger way, right? Which is um, which is this thing, and now it operates at a very very large scale, and uh, but it has the, it needs some of these characteristics that I'm talking to you about. By the way, Reginald, being 38. Don't don't worry about it, dude. That's that's you, you go and you, you, you develop and you develop. Philip right? Johnson went it's to totally s stupid. It's, you know, that's he went to architecture school at forty. Philip Johnson entered the first year of architecture school at forty. 
That's one okay. of the horrible things in our system <laughs> that you have to go through like a little piece of machinery. You go to high school and college and then you go to grad school. It's the stupidest thing. I have to tell you with most of my students, I would, I would get them out of school. They're, they're super smart. They have lots of skill. They're babies. They need to grow up first, come back when they're 30, especially grad school, really. A complete, instead of reading Marinetti's um, a, a piece on Marrakesh, go to Marrakesh and then read it and decide whether you agree with them. And now you're going to read it and go, eh, got it wrong on this one, right? <laughs> Honestly. Um, it's, it's, it's Thank so you. <laughs> I've got a son that's just coming out of law school. We let him go and he's 33 and he's just fine. It took him to where he wanted to go when he was ready to do it. Leave him alone, right? Do it when you're ready. Don't worry about it. You're not going to have been ready. Take your, take your 50 yeah. yet anyway. So relax. You guys have a lot of time. Yeah. If anything, this this experience, this experience made me realize that uh, my experience in the world and, and my, my, my state of consciousness, consciousness is determined by my age or anything like that. It's like I... And this is my, where my comment about about you being just so engaged um, in your seventies, and and you guys are, I'm I'm assuming you had this this conversation at the, the same type of intensity, the same type of complexity thirty years ago ago, and like you know when you were my age, and, and that that's just really encouraging. Um, Actually, when I was your age, I was kind of sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> No, it's funny, you know, um, I, I, growing up, I have to tell a story because uh, the drawings you're looking at were done with a, a young guy that came out of Syrac and we got to know each other quite well over the year. We're doing those, uh, those, uh, the, uh, the Marquettes, the, the physical ones, the, uh, the Dwaddles. Um, and he, he was a ball player and he played for the Seattle uh, uh, Supersonics uh, pro ball, right? Baseball. And we were discussing, because uh, he was quite unusual for Cyark. He was very disciplined and he was very um, kind of mature and kind of rigorous in his approach to the work. And, and I was asking him about it and he said, oh, no, no, it had nothing to do with architecture school. It had to do with being a baseball player. And it's the ninth inning and it, there's a guy on base and they're behind by two points and uh, there's one out and the pitcher uh, is a left-hander specializing in sinkers and fastballs, and they change him for a right-hander who specializes in something else, curveballs or something. He has to know the pitcher. He has to get a hit that he doesn't get a job if he can't hit the ball once in a while, right? And he had, he was just an incredibly mature guy. I mean, that was his life. He grew up like that, right? Playing ball. He did it since he was a young guy. And it was the greatest story. I'm going, guy, we we don't treat our architecture students like that. They're, they're never under that the, the kind of like, hey man, the, the, it's, it's normal to be under a certain kind of healthy pressure yeah. to produce something. But I've always, I've always joked with him that being a ball player and being an architect is a great combo. It really trained him for a, a really bloody tough. I got to tell a story when we met 37 years ago, I saw, I, I, I went to a conference in Banff. My, yeah. The way I went there, is, that's a whole different story, but he showed a few slides of his work and he was doing a house called 2468 house and he showed a slide of himself with a jackhammer jackhammering some concrete that the contractor put in wrong in his obsessive you know kind of first buildings and i said hey who is this guy tom i said you want to go swimming and we went swimming in a pool it was a heated pool big pool outside in banff but it was snowing <laughs> and there we were and that's where I met 37 years ago. I met him swimming in the snow, falling in our face in a swimming pool because he was obsessive. I knew the guy cared about architecture. Because I swim in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. You guys are scattered around the world, I take it. Oh, Tom, I had a quick question. Um, I'm, in, I'm in Maryland myself. Um, I, I really like how you describe your work as. Sorry. Where are you? I'm looking for you. Um, okay, I got you. Oh, can you see me now? Yep. Oh, cool. I, I really enjoy how you describe your your uh, some of your drawings as an accretion event because I I can relate to that as well. I, you know, I have all these um, just like really everybody. I've, I've got all these sketches in my my notebook that I don't really know where they come from. They just emerge, and um, they could only have come at a certain 
you know, time and day. And when I look back, um, I sort of recognize myself in the, in, in the, in the actual painting. Um, so I really liked at this particular moment where you were stacking up your drawings over time and seeing sort of the, the chain, the shifts. And, and it came to me that it seems like you're actually sort of mapping your own mind. And hmm. um, that reminds me of this, there's this Lebius Woods uh, blog entry about you. And it's like, it says something like, what's on Tom's main, what's on Tom's, Tom Main's mind. And then it starts off by saying, uh, or better yet, what's in it, you know, what's in your mind. So it basically seemed like throughout this whole lecture, I was actually just looking at different pictures of your, of your actual mind, which is pretty fascinating. And, and this is all to say that at, at some point that the mind becomes the actual architecture because you have to sort of iterate to, be, to make a building. And through these iterations, um, you, you, you seem to have all these sort of uh, prescriptive or algorithmic tools that you use. Um, Jack, can you? Yep. Keep going, Jack. We lost you for a minute. Oh, okay. So I was just going to say that so there's a sort of transformation between the actual your actual mind, which I would say is, is it's fairly direct between your mind and your drawing, and that hence the intuition. And I, I would say a very similar thing about Stephen Hall. And then it's transformation into architecture. And it's very interesting because you had all these very high definition renderings with people inside your buildings walking around and, and, and it kind of struck me that they were sort of walking around your mind, but it worked as a piece of architecture. And it's it gave me a very strange uh, sensation. No, I guess you could say that about most architects, though, that you are moving through their mind. Yeah. And these, uh, I had happened to spend quite a bit of time talking to Lebius about these drawings before he died. And, and he brought that up and that he thought that, and we discussed this, I think I, I wrote a little piece on this, that this is, um, you're looking at my brain and you're looking at it under different conditions right, and right. Um, in different, different locations. And it, it, you can definitely say that. It's just, it's a kind of a lyrical, kind of a broad notion, but you're definitely looking at my brain and how I think. And if you knew me more, um, it would mean more because I do, um, I'm dyslexic. Uh, I'm I'm just about ADD. I have a very kind of weird way I order things in my world to my family and my boy. And even at a really personal level, it, it would even make more sense that yeah, this looks like Tom's brain, and this is the Tom I know. Or, or if it's not that one, it looks like that. It looks like that. Yeah, and um, it's true. And, and, but again, now you're discussing a very particular kind of abstract drawing that is somehow does locate you, that you have, you've, you've jettisoned a lot of day-to-day -day stuff and you have found a kind of an abstract language, but you could have done it just by pushing a line on a piece of paper. Again, you could look at many, many artists and architects that do that. And I'm thinking of uh, uh, Eric Kahn or, or, or Michele Sae in the West Coast and look at their drawings and or you could draw to music. I mean, th that's a, a really common notion, right? You can you can describe yourself mm -hmm. through through drawings in a more emotional sense. Yeah. And yes, you're you're correct. But I think some of that is going to come because you um you just kind of need to do it. <laughs> I'm not sure you can prescribe it. Uh, if you're going to do that's it, why, you're just do it. That's why this this talk is so exciting because this <laughs> most of the work in this talk there free to do it. In other words, you don't need to have a commission by a, you know, a kind of whatever to yeah. do, to do this work. I mean, these are for nobody. I, also, I would say with Lebius and Raymond Abraham, I believe architecture exists, whether or not it's built and it has a power, you know, Raymond Abraham didn't build that many things. Lebius built one thing, you know, that, that I helped him build in, in Chengdu, but the work exists and it has a power. I really like that one student is starting from a Lebius Woods inspiration because I, I think it's a, it's a very valid dimension of architecture. Yeah. Thanks a and, lot for bringing this into, into T-Space. I had a lot of fun in the lecture. Thank you. Okay. I think that's We're okay. I think that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've lost you guys for some reason. I don't have any images here. We're good. I think that... Uh, this was very, very uh, 
I mean, no, I don't have words to describe it. I'm fascinated. <laughs> and I'm very, very thankful for this conversation. Thank you for your time, for your energy, for sharing those uh, amazing <laughs> artifacts. It's incredible. Terrific. Thanks Steven, so much. Enjoy. Steven, thank you for making this possible. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bye bye, everybody. Get to work. You, you got a, you've got a, a week left. <laughs> thank do you. Some, do some drawings. Become obsessive. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Take care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to give you a tour. We'll go take your things. Recording has stopped right there. Uh, yes, we're still here. Um, Maria, I'm still here just as my computer's on. Yes. <laughs> and Max is still on the top of my screen. So, oh, hello. Tom, there were still <laughs> questions for you. Oh, it's just the I three thought. of us are left for some it's reason. It's just the three of us, yeah. Yeah. Well, nice I to meet so. you. Unless you're live on YouTube, I don't know. <laughs> bye bye.